thank you ramesh thank you uh, organizing committee for inviting me for this talk my job is actually very simple all that i need to tell you is that the treatment of postural valves does not stop with the ablation of the valves in fact i think if you ask me <coughs> the overall management of the patient begins after the valves have been ablated we all have used different techniques for ablating valves uh, this is the equipment which we have in our institution for ablating the valves um, we use we, we began with this uh, uh, <coughs> wire um, electrode then we switched over to the laser um, then the laser went out of order and we switched over to the cold knife and we like the cold knife so much better than the laser that we are now doing almost all ablations with the cold knife there has been a, a kind of evolution in the management of posterior tal valves and we are very satisfied um, <coughs> this is a kind of result which you get on the table this is exactly what i was trying to say that even even though that you may produce such a wonderful stream of urine on the table the treatment does not end there we have done considerable improvement as far as the short term prognosis of these patients is concerned uh, with good antenatal diagnosis uh, Im much improved surgical and endoscopic techniques and supportive care however what we need to understand is that the ultimate prognosis depends on the severity of the secondary pathology involving the upper tracts and the bladder we are all familiar with what the valve bladder syndrome is all about this is very very necessary to understand that even though the valves have been ablated the uh, micturition patterns may remain abnormal may be persistently abnormal because the bladder dynamics are altered and these bladder dynamics may never return to normal and this is something which we need to understand in posterior urethral valves a lot of these children will require supportive management in order to correct the problems created by the valve bladder syndrome so essentially what we need to look at in the post operative or in the post ablation period are the renal functions the continence status the sexual functions and the fertility outcomes um, <coughs> we did a um, and i'll give you examples of uh, of various studies which we have done in our department to highlight uh, the these uh, parameters uh, we looked at the renal functions in our patients uh, we found that serum creatinine was uh, was raised uh, at presentation in more than half our patients but what was important is that one year after the ablation of valves there was a significant drop in the elevation of creatinine which basically means about half the patients who had elevated creatinine at the time of presentation came back to normal but this <coughs> cohort of patients who had an abnormal abnormally elevated serum creatinine persisted later on as well so all patients will not revert to a normal creatinine and the best prognostic indication will be the creatinine which you get one year after ablation of valves uh, there is a lot of literature about one year of age in posterior tal valves however since in our uh, setup patients come at different age groups this is something which is uh, which is of importance and which we need to understand if the pressures are are elevated uh, <coughs> then and become become normal in the post operative period then there is a certain risk of decompensation at puberty so this is again a, a cohort of patients which needs to be kept under close observation persistent hydrouretral nephrosis if the uh, hydronephrosis persists then a large number of patients will go into chronic renal failure similarly vesicouretric reflux the higher the grade of vesicouretric reflux the worse is likely to be the uh, prognosis we looked at the growth and development of uh, these uh, children the growth and development uh, in terms of physical parameters as well as the renal growth a large number of these patients would have abnormal growth uh, patterns at uh, presentation which basically means that the growth velocity is reduced however some of these patients would have a pickup growth once the valves have been ablated and the renal functions have improved so as you can see that if the <coughs> height is normal or if there has been a pickup growth then the incidence of chronic renal failure in these patients is much less but in those patients where the growth is retarded or it shows a deceleration then there is a higher chance of 
chronic renal failure developing in later life or it may already be there at that moment of time. The similar pattern is seen as far as the weight of these children is concerned. But again, when we look at the uh, renal growth patterns, we find that if the patients have abnormal renal functions, then the renal growth is less than the two standard deviations of, of normal. And this is based on a study uh, which we did in our department. We created a, a norm normogram for the renal growth across different uh, uh, age groups and then we compared the renal growth of the posterior urethral valve patients with these uh, parameters. Then again, <coughs> we find that there is a very high incidence of voiding uh, dysfunction in these uh, patients uh, even after the valves have been ablated. Even though you may get a good stream uh, on table, uh, you may not get a normal pattern of micturition in the post-operative period. Again, when you look at what kind of initial treatment was these patients were administered, we realized that a, a lot of these patients uh, underwent Bloxham's uh, vesicostomy because that was a very popular procedure in those uh, days and there was, there was a lack of uh, uh, small sized equipment for these patients. So all these patients who had a vesicostomy, they had very poor uh, bladder functions. And these bladder functions uh, remained in the post-operative period. Again, <coughs> as far as the continence was concerned, like I said, there was a lot of voiding dysfunction. Some of these patients uh, dribbled uh, even later on in life. We found a very nice solution to them. We used imipramine, which is a cyclic uh, antidepressant. It has an ad a strong anticholinergic-like action on the bladder, and it also has an alpha adrenergic uh, uh, action. So it relax the, relaxes the bladder and at the same time produces a higher pressure at the uh, bladder outlet. We used the semipremine in our patients and, and we found that it increased the, uh, the maximum systematic capacity. It took away the uninhibited detrusor contractions and the pressure specific bladder volume also improved. So by and large, imipramine <coughs> was looked upon, uh, at least in our cohort of patients, as a good uh, method of treatment for voiding dysfunction. I'll end my talk by giving a few <coughs> uh, a, a glimpse of what we found as far as the sexual functions were concerned and the implications of these as far as fertility outcomes were concerned. If you look at the uh, semen analysis uh, in, in some of these volunteer patients who volunteered to be a part of this uh, study, we find that a large number of parameters as far as the semen analysis are concerned were abnormal. For example, there was abnormal uh, agglutination, uh, the liquefaction time was prolonged, there was abnormal viscosity, the sperms were immotile and there was a very high incidence uh, uh, infiltration of leukocytes. When we looked at the endocrine profile of these uh, patients, we found that the prolactin levels were elevated in a large number of these patients and we know that <coughs> prolactin um, hyperprolactinemia is known to cause slow ejaculation, erectile dysfunction and loss of libido. Now this is, a, this is a picture which I like showing. This is a gentleman who was our patient once upon a time and it's, and it's very heartening to see that he's grown into a strapping young man and has produced uh, two children. Uh, we haven't done a genetic analysis to say that uh, the paternity uh, issues are sorted out but we believe him when he says that they are his sons. But at the same time, we continue to see patients like this. And this is where I think, uh, th this is the uh, important factor. We, we should avoid looking at patients in the long term who look like this. And that is why it is important that we follow up our patients over a long period of time. Thank you.